and I know you remember this. I mean, you'd you'd go through the airport with your pocket knife. Yep. Not you know they'd. Hey, they'd... trust me, I went through the airport with a lot of stuff in my pockets. <laughs> and never had to worry about it. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, hit that subscribe button now. You're going to like it. Welcome to the Luke Branquino Show. My next guest does not need an introduction. He's a good friend, and he is the 2000 Pro Rodeo Hall of Fame inductee. Joe Beaver, thanks for joining me, man. Thanks, Luke. Good to talk to you, old boy. Man, it is. And, and speaking of talking, we've always had great conversations, uh, just obviously in private. We'll, we, you know, That's one thing I've always loved about you is you, uh, you go ahead and Tell it how it is, and we'll talk about whatever we need to talk about. And um, and it's insightful for me because I've learned so much just listening to your stories. Well, you know, I was lucky. I got to see you start, you know. I saw you come along when, when you didn't have um, the shuffle, the booty shuffle, and all the gold buckles. <laughs> so it was fun for me to watch you come along. And we had a lot of fun. We, You know, we had a lot of airplanes together. Um, that's one thing I kind of thought you caught on early. You know, a guy could fly around and and save some time and, and get some rest and we've had a lot of we've had a lot of fun together i enjoyed competing in your zone of era where it was fun to watch four or five guys that i thought capitalized in your event and you know to be a part of it you know, with bill and bob and them, those guys it was fun well i could remember speaking of flying around and it was you that told me you get your nfr bag and i mean that is that's the deal and you got it strapped on your shoulder and, and i mean it weighs 65 yeah. pounds yeah it's not light <laughs> and and you had a roller bag and you said yep. look at these look at these idiots packing this big ass heavy bag around and you got your roller bag this is way easier and it was that conversation we had that i went ahead and switched to a roller bag because it, i mean it just makes sense right but you're right everybody carried the big bags you know and, and i and i always had a brace bag and so did you so yep. that's a little bag we had to carry because no if we didn't take our hats our clothes or whatever we had to have our knee braces right so we carried <laughs> those all the time but i yeah i thought you know it's a lot easier uh ricky canton actually was the one that i saw going through an airport you know and he used to fly everywhere he wouldn't drive anywhere and he was rolling through with that roller bag i thought you know i, I gotta be smarter than stronger I, got, I gotta take care of myself and it was funny because i remember you guys y'all all kind of looked at me like i was weird with the roller bag until everybody got one <laughs> well and especially when you get off the airplane and you're late and you're lugging this son of a bitch around and you just <laughs> wheel along with that roller bag i mean it, it just makes sense right yeah oh my yeah. god it's the old thing it's the old thing luke and we've talked about a million times about competing places it's common sense if a person would use more common sense in their everyday life and decision making i think it would be a whole lot easier every day but we don't you know and i say we because i damn sure don't you know as an 11 year old dragging around the arena with the help of family friend john black i never imagined that i'd be standing up here hey luke husky trailer and parts company wants to congratulate you on your induction into the 2023 pro rodeo hall of fame what an amazing achievement a five-time world champion and now legend in the pro rodeo hall of fame husky is honored to sponsor such an amazing athlete your talent drive dedication and unwavering commitment to the rodeo community continues to be inspiring to this and next generation of rodeo stars husky rides with you always as you continue to make your mark in the rodeo world here's to you luke for your outstanding success in the arena and as well as your induction into the Pro Rodeo Hall of Fame. And get to back to the bag, it was so the first time or anytime you make the NFR for the folks that don't know, you get a bag that says contestant. It has the NFR emblem logo. It has your back number. I mean, this is it's it's cool. So yes, every contestant that you know gets one is like, I'm packing this. I want everybody to know that I made the NFR. That's right. That's right. You know, you know what else was funny to me? is if you the first time you make them the first couple times and then even later you know they give the contestant jacket and it's it, it used to be it used to not be copied it was a different made different color you know right. whatever you couldn't buy the same one you could buy something like it but back in the day you couldn't buy that one you know right and i thought it was always funny to go to like to the winter rodeos denver everybody was cold they all had them on but sometimes at san Antonio it might be warm or El Paso or Houston, and they still had that NFR jacket on. You know what I mean? Guilty. <laughs> Guilty. Yeah, me too. Me too. <laughs> because I think 
I think we know we've we saw that as youngsters or maybe as permit guy or whatever you were first time and you think man I want one of those jackets that means I, I belong you know right. and it was the same way with the bag it's it's almost like it's a um it's almost like it's a uh it's a war emblem you know what I mean I fought the battles and I made it through the war and look what I got no uh, you're exactly you, right I'm gonna send you a picture I just uh, my mom passed away last year this time and she had what Nathan Steinberg calls um, a, a cracker barrel of Joe Beaver shit in her house. You know, it's just everything from way back. So I had a lot of old bags. I didn't, you know, I forgot I even had because, you know, as, you know, as I do, you use them, they get dirty, use them up, whatever. The next year you get new and you throw that one down and get another one. So I had, I never would have thought of this, but uh, Linda Hedden and Jenner, they redid this. We, re, we had a garage just made into a trophy room, you know, it's huge. It's all my mom's stuff and everything. But they took those those leather emblems off and you used them on for seat covers, seat cushions, oh, wow. like put them in chairs and stuff. And, you know, they would have been thrown away if I had anything to do with it. They were gone. I never even would have thought about it. But it's the little things like that that you go back and look at. Those are our war emblems. We did yeah. fight the battle many times to get those. So I think that's why they're so cherished. No, for sure. And, and I have up in the, the attic, I was going through trying to get stuff put together for my Hall of Fame, you know, yep. Yep. deal. And I'm going through stuff. I'm like, I haven't seen, hell, I haven't seen some of these. Get home from the finals in December, you you put them in put storage, them you don't That's see right. them again. Uh, you know, right. it brought back a lot of a lot of cool memories of, you know, walking up on the stage, getting your back number and, and all that, you know. Uh, another funny, fun story for me was, you and in fact i seen tommy guy the other day you and i and him were flying i think through phoenix phoenix yeah <laughs> and remember we went order breakfast got steak and eggs and they gave us a spork yep yeah you know, just and those it was a pretty he was a nice little restaurant too remember it wasn't like it was a we sat down and ordered and they're given and i'm like 20 bucks for a fork what what kind of why can't we get real stuff well, and, and I remember it was, I think it was after September 11th, you know, a few months later. You couldn't get anything. Couldn't get nothing. Hey, if you remember when we walked to that airport that morning, we, we talked to it. There wasn't, there wasn't 20 people on our flight. No. If you no. remember, we went to there. We, when we got on that, we were, I, we had been to Pendleton and going to Albuquerque or going something. Going to like Albuquerque that. in Kansas City, I think. Okay, that's what it was. Cause remember, they closed the airports during yep. Pendleton, but we were at, at Albuquerque going back to Kansas City and across. And 20, 30 people were all you saw on planes, and you could not get a metal fork or knife anywhere, you know. No, and it used to be, and I know you remember this, I mean, you'd, you'd go through the airport with your pocket knife. Yep. Not, you know, they'd, hey, they'd... trust me, I went through the airport with a lot of stuff in my pockets. <laughs> and never had to worry about it. <laughs> yeah. We're going to get into yeah. that. Way different back there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and, and we will get into that. But I mean, like I said, I, I learned I learned so much from. Oh, another story if I say about learned so much. We were driving from San Angelo Short Round to Tucson Short Round. Tucson. Mm -hmm. Tanner Milan was with us, and I'm sure you remember this. I can remember I opened the trailer or window of the trailer. I'm like, okay, we're in Tucson. I'm like, damn, the truck ain't running, but we're still moving. He had run us out of gas and for whatever reason coasted us right to the diesel pump i don't know if you remember that or not but out of gas out of diesel out zero zero out <laughs> none left like we're not gonna make it we're not i don't know how i hell i wouldn't have made it to the exit yeah, he exactly got it over the hill of the exit and right in beside it like nothing ever happened yeah but you know what they said about us too though guys that win a lot we're lucky and we are lucky i mean you know i tell them all the time it's like a I do, you know, like the talk the junior high. I said, when I look up in the stands, I see, you know, dedication, determination, and luck. And and it, trust me, I'm okay with people always saying we're lucky. Oh, y'all are lucky. Y'all win. Y'all are lucky. Yeah, we are lucky. But we also had so much determination and so much dedication that when luck came around the corner, it made us pretty hard to beat, dude. Friends, whatever trailer parts you need, brakes, axles, wiring, go to Husky Trailer and Parts Company. Visit them at huskytrailerstx.com slash Luke. All the top brands and thousands of parts are in stock and ready to ship. The best part is shipping is always free anywhere in the lower 48. Husky has been in the business for more than 60 years. I rely on Husky for my trailer parts needs. Husky, generations of trust delivery. 
Well, yeah, and to me, and I've always said this, and I tell all the people, kids at my clinics or people, students, luck to me is when preparation meets opportunity. Sure it is. I mean, everybody's going to be lucky, but I'm going to tell you what else they don't they don't think about. Sometimes that luck doesn't show its head when we really need it because of our skill level. And I, and I don't yeah. say that knocking anybody else, and I don't say that, but like, for instance, flaggers, people not wanting you to ride their horse or want you to ride their horse, um, trying to get traded, you know, all that also comes into where the luck will go against you because 80%, 70% of the field think that you're not just trying to do something to get a, another run. You're trying to better yourself in a position so they won't trade. You know yeah. what I mean? No, no, they no. won't trade because they think, and all we're trying to do is run another one. And a flag man name may not give you a call when he gets pushed in a bind there because, oh, that's not going to, I'm, I'm not going to help that. You know, he wins enough. Not meaning to do it, but subconsciously doesn't give you the break. He might give that guy that's not the, getting the name all the time. You know, I've had, and you've had it happen more than a ride. I'd go up more than a ride and they're like, mm, nah. they know you got a chance to beat them when they, if you're asking to ride their horse is good. And, and they don't, some of them mean it, some of them don't. But I, you know, I've been turned down and walked away and thought, yeah, you just cost yourself some out money, you know. But yeah. I think luck goes both ways when you're at the top of your game for as long as as guys like us were. But you and you, you say luck too, like that. As far as we worked hard enough, we've always worked. We've always tried to better ourselves. And I said this, you know, when I won my first world championship, when we get home from Vegas, you start at the bottom. You you yep. have to prove yourself, and not to them. You have to prove yourself to yourself. That you to be the best, you got to work your ass off to get there. And I feel like when people say you're lucky, yeah, you make a great run. Okay, somebody else comes back and runs that steer that calf. Well, guess what? They may not be as fast on him because we put in that extra effort, that extra preparation. They think he's the best one in the world, but they can't win shit on him. That's right. I, you know, it's funny you bring that up. I just had this conversation with with John yesterday. Um, John Douch, my boy John. You know, he's. He's yep. got some abilities there that people can't, they overlook. And he ran just an absolute pig for his first one at Reno. Total eliminator, no chance. And what I told him was, I said, John, she eliminated you by kicking. You know, she wouldn't take the tie. But you let somebody else run her, they're going to be eliminated by how much she ran because he reached and used his rope. And then he flanked her in midair. She weighed 250 and was coming up the rope. And I said, you know, they're not going to realize that it's not the kicking that's going to get them. It's either getting outrun or run over. So it's that preparation and that that talent that he uses and, and possesses that made that calf eliminate him at the very end when somebody else is going to get eliminated when they nod their head. <laughs> well, that, yeah, that's exactly right. They're, they're eliminated before. If that calf lays and he did everything else as he was they're, supposed they're to. They're still eliminated. That's right. That's yeah. exactly right. Yep. And I you know, remember and, a steer. If you and if you think you might remember, think back. You're riding the brown horse of, I don't know, was it Sleepy's? Did I? He had the big brown. Jack remember Pop, way back Ryan there? Fields, yeah. Okay, yep. Okay, you ran a steer at I think it was Hermiston. At the old, well, I've never been to the new one, but oh, I think it was Hermiston. It could have been Caldwell. I can't remember for sure, but you ran a a big red, big red steer, big horn. And I remember he's over talking about him, and nobody wanted. To, but you said if I can just get his head. If I can just get him facing the broken shoots, he will go off like crazy, you know. And then we were me and you were sitting and talking. I said, "Well, it looks to me like you need a really good head catch." And you looked over at me and you went, "You said head catch is a day is a, or is the menu, on the menu today, you know." And you might have run him a jumper, and that bay horse would get wide, yeah. You know, if you jack with him. But I remember you running him like kicking with that left foot. You were already making your move, but your left foot was still kicking. It wasn't in the stirrup, but you were trying to get every ounce of the head catch. And he just wham, he went off everybody hoop and hollered and laughed. And I they probably didn't win nothing on that steer up till then or maybe after. But you knew what you had to do to win on him, so you did it. And right. that's where I think, guys, I really and, and man, I'm not being judgmental at all. But I really think a lot of people this day and age, instead of just doubling up and fighting their way out of a corner, if they don't have the perfect opportunity or chance. They're 50% beat when they nod because they don't try to figure out how to beat them. Does that make oh, sense? Yo, you're 100. I think you're 100% right. And Cade Swore and I, you know, Cade 
just one of yeah. my best friends. You know, we yep. every rodeo we go to, we talk about that. And there'd be a steer. He, he'd watch all the bull on the slack, and there'd be a steer like, man, that one sucks. You know, they didn't have any luck on him. Like, I went yeah. around on him. And just knowing how to get by those, and they might have one little thing you need to get by, and then they're gone. And that reminds me of a steer at Clovis. He was an ugly, fighting bullhorn looking steer, and, and they, you know, they get, they were long on him, sixes and sevens. Yep. And uh, Kay's like, man, he sucks. I said, I went around on that steer. He was just flat enough, but if you got him early, he's gone. Nobody would yep. get him early. And yep. sure as shit, I come back in the third round, the progressive round there at Clovis. And I told Kate, I said, I got him. He's like, oh, man, I was like, no, I'm, I'm happy because he let you catch up. And I'd win the round on him. I think I'd come back and win second or win the rodeo. But for me, I'd watch those steers people would hate. And I'd be like, I know how to get by that one. I know how to get by that one. The yep. good ones, you know how to get by because you prepared for all that. But having that, that mental that, attitude. That, that That's what I was going to say. The mental part of it. That's what Bill Pace, you know, always told me. It, it, we, he'd draw one come in and say, okay, remember, I'm going to more money throwing my hand up catching the left horn than I can reach him for this, uh, this steer. Do not let this steer take advantage of me when I catch him. And, what you know, and I, I, I knew what he meant. You get up there and make him do something because if guys like y'all could get your hands on the horns and get a go from the stirrup, the rest was just – textbook practice yeah you know y'all knew you, 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 that was a game winner and it's the same way in any like i think caleb griggers has changed heading immensely because of the fact that when he first came over here he had the ability to throw from the back of the chute like every, yep. like nobody's business but he's learned to ride one two throw and let and and he doesn't miss well guess what if you got a quarterback that throws that ball in the end zone in the corner every time just high enough that the defender can't hit it and you can catch it, you're going to score a lot of points. Yeah, and that's... he's done that because he's figured out mentally how to do it. He had the physical ability, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. And watching him from a from when he first started, I believe he was with Brad Culpepper roping, right? Way different. Mm -hmm. yeah. Way different. And, I mean, mm -hmm. just that maturity level. And I know he he quit drinking and quit partying. And, and yeah. I mean, I, I'm sure that had some to do with it. But he was starting to figure it out before that. Um, yeah, yeah. You just, just little tweaks and – in whatever can make a difference in being great or being good and being great. Yeah. And there is a difference, you know, and I'm sorry. I mean, I tell, I tell, you know, people this, they don't believe me, but that's one reason my body shot and yours too. And, you know, and Fred's and, you know, I can go through a bunch of guys, Cody. I mean, we, we practice so much and, and I'll be honest with you. I've told like John and Kobe to back off. Don't yeah. worry your body's out. Like I did in the practice pit. Because Mike Arnold and I, and you know, he lived with me for three, four, two, three years, and Fred lived with me for a year or two. And I'm telling you, we rope, we rope fifty or sixty a night, and it wasn't nothing to it. We didn't think, but it, it it was a double edged sword. It mastered our ability to where, when Fred got on the scene, he was just like me. Here he came, you know. He was he was ready. He was dominant. But it also took a toll on our body. That I think we've had a lot of surgeries early on that maybe. You know the guys don't have to have that didn't really overexert themselves. Yeah, but you could see the guys that don't overexert themselves and and how much they got won as far as world championships compared. Well, I'm to... looking in I'm looking in the camera right now. You see all that stuff behind you? That didn't come with not overexert. That's why you've had so many surgeries because just like when you came back the first time you hurt, I can't remember which arm it was. Not it wasn't the last but but in the, and everybody's like, man, he's gonna have to ease on that. I said, like, well, he's gonna hurt himself again. <laughs> Because you weren't going to ease around. And when you hooked up, you're going to bring him back over your left leg like you are never had a surgery. And that's yeah. hard. It's hard to do one, and it's hard to keep it sound, too, you know? Yeah. Well, I know in, in 14 when I tore my lat and had four months to get ready for the finals, and the one doctor said, yeah, we'll get you ready, and everybody else said, no, you're, you're, you won't be ready. I did more. I think I only jumped maybe 10 steers before the final. I don't even think it was that. Because in my head, I didn't want to – Heard it, but what I did do is I watched hours of YouTube videos, not of anybody else, but of myself when I was throwing the hell out of them because that's what I wanted my mind to do. So when you did get your hands on one, you didn't think about the other. You knew what you needed to feel as you watched to get ready. Yeah, yeah, exactly right. And then I had that was I don't know if it was the best NFR I had and end up winning the coming back and winning the world, but I was mentally prepared more so than physically and i was probably in the best shape of my life going into the national finals but as far as bulldogging physically physically wise i was way more mentally prepared for that nfr than any of the other ones well and you'd already run a million head of steers you know what i mean uh, 
that I remember when guys first started taking Kevs and, and, and Team Rubble Steer stuff out to the national finals, you know, to practice. Everybody, you know, this guy take four, this guy take five, this guy. And I told my dad, I said, man, I got to get another trailer, I guess, get some Kevs to take out to Vegas. And he's like, what are you taking Kevs to Vegas for? They have Kevs out there every night for you to roll. <laughs> and I said, well, everybody's uh, taking practice Kevs to tune up during the week. He looked at me and he said, I hate to tell you, but if you're not ready by the time you get out there, four to calves a day ain't going to help you. <laughs> you. You've run 10 million head. You've been there 10 years or 12 or 15 before everybody started that, you know. And he said, you think you need to practice during the day? He said, do I need to remind you that you compete from your shoulders down and win from your shoulders up? And I was like, no. He said, well, then you're ready. Go. And that's kind of that's kind of how I was. I was like, yeah, that's kind of stupid, me thinking I need to practice because – our, our physical game was ready, you know, and, and I went a couple years that I shouldn't have went that was hurt, you know, like I went, I shouldn't have went in 91 um, or 90, whatever that was. I had knee surgery after the Fiesta and Angelo, you know, I had knee surgery November the 8th and I tried to rope out there. It was, it was stupid, you know, I shouldn't have went. But other than that, a couple times, if you look back, Luke, Honestly, if we ever cost ourselves any money out there, it was mentally, not our ability physically. Oh, 100%. And, I, and when you mentioned that, it takes me right back to 2007. Go in, season leader. I think I, you know, and that, and that was that was a, a feat, you know, not that it is. Sure. Now, to get that season leader buckle, you know, and Gunner wasn't in as good a shape as he had been in the past. And I don't think I want to check until the sixth or seventh round. And and you know how it is, guys like us. We go out there, we expect to win every night. And yes. No and especially the first three. Especially yes. the first three. Because that's when you want to draw blood right off the bat. And and I've always told people before I go keep going, the first three rounds are the easiest for me for me to win in. Because I'm going to blow, try to blow the bear out every time. I don't. Yes. You know. Yes. You're not just there to get by the first three. And, and hey, look, for people who don't realize, a lot of times half the field just want to get by the first three rounds. Half the field are not going to go at them like you and I were. You know, we're going to go at them. Hey, Cody Olwood, you know, Fred Whitfield, I, Brent Lewis. But, I mean, there was always a half, a half the field that they were just okay. They want to get by maybe. But those first three, get after. That's our rounds. That's I love those rounds because yep. you, you, even now, and you know when we work TV, you talk to them guys like, well, we want to kind of see what these steers do. These steers have been ran enough. You got to take a chance because you need to capitalize on those first three rounds because you may yep. need that money come the tenth round. And I'll tell you this: those rounds get a hell of a lot harder to win when the reruns start. <laughs> Sorry, but fact is fact is fact, fiction is fiction. You know, you get the you and in the steer wrestling and the calf roping, it really shows to me. If a guy has one that they won first, second, or third on, they step up. They think, oh, you know, instead of needing to really step up when you have the one that they were seven on or 11 on the calf row. You know what I mean? Yeah. But boy, you give a guy that good one and their light comes on and they're ready. So the rounds get tougher. You better get that money early on. But in 07, I thought you didn't have the snap and the power you're used to having when you nodded your head at first. No, no. And, and I didn't, and I didn't, it, I didn't practice for whatever reason coming up to the finals that your gunner wasn't in the greatest shape. I didn't practice like I needed to. And it's almost like I had taken a year off from bulldogging completely, went to the NFR. It took a little while to get the gears turning, get them greased up, and then come back and place in the seventh round, maybe place in the eighth round, and then won the ninth and tenth round. And, yep. you know, I and that year I went, what in the, after that year was over, I went, what in the hell do I need, what did I do? And I, you know, you go back on what you did and, and get rid of it and change it and fix it. Then the next yep. year, come back on Willie, and and I, do, I mean, dominated that year, end up winning, winning the world in 08. And, uh, but yeah, you, you got to take advantage of those first first three rounds, and I preach that. You know, but it, it, you name you call something else out that makes a big difference too. Those guys, there's some guys now um, that really, that really win. And if you look at it, nine out of ten times, they've got the best horses. Yeah, and they're riding the best horses. And that's another thing I think a winner does. Um, a winner will either get off of one that's not winning. Hey, I've tied mine up at the a many a time to ride better. You know what I mean? If if I got someplace and I remember one time I was at at El Paso and I and I it was I didn't I needed to win something. It was in 
like maybe the last year I made them 06 because it was when my dad was real sick and I was back and forth and they had it out there on a, like a baseball field or something. Yeah. Put an arena yeah, up. exactly. Remember that? Yeah. And it was big and wide. And I had a little sorrel horse that was tight and couldn't run much. And and I, I pulled up that day and there was two good horses in my set. I never even saddled him. I just took my rope can and walked up there because, and I remember, you know, somebody saying, I can't remember who's driving for me. You know, well, I said, saddle a head horse, don't saddle a calf horse. Why, why? You're not real. I said, no, I'm roping. Well, you've been winning on him. And I just won some in Albuquerque, but big different setup. Oh, yeah. You know, Albuquerque and that, that arena was big, wide. And I said, you know what? Pride, pride can cost you a lot. <laughs> yeah. I don't mind paying mountain money because I need to win right now. And I remember I placed, I, I don't know, I went third or fourth, but it was a big, you know, everybody was like, your horse is here. That's stupid. And and I'll tell you this, the first guy I asked said, man, your, you got, what's wrong with your horse? I said, ain't nothing wrong with my horse. And he said, well, you know, if he was crippled, Joe, or if he was, you know, I'd let you. I said, ain't no problem. Because he, he didn't want to let me on because I had a horse. And I did. I had a horse. And he was fine. You know, he was at Albuquerque night before with me. And, the, and, and I said, that's okay. No big deal. And I went to the next guy. You know, and I paid him whatever, seven or eight hundred bucks, and he was happy, and we went right on. But I think now, just like that right there, you talk about when Gunner wasn't at his best. As good as Gunner was, when he wasn't at his best, he he was he was still wasn't helping you like he could. Right. Yeah. Well, and that brings you to Rodney Burks and that great horse Zan. You know, they want to pile on that horse, and I was at San Angelo. I think that was actually 07 as well. Um, Short round at San Angelo, made it back mm, towards the bottom. Middle, ah, middle of the pack, but it was tight. Yeah. Pull up in there and I got jackpot from Brian and Cindy Fields. Got him saddled, gave him his medicine, you know, like we all would do, give him Bamine or Butte, whatever. And uh, walk up, see what I got drawn. Go down the list, this steer mortally flew. And you know how little San Angelo the building is. Yes. And yeah. Rodney's sitting right there and he's like, man, that one runs. I said, hey, you got room on Zan tonight? And he just smiled and said, you bet. And he had guys that were ahead of me in the average. Chancey Larson, I think maybe had win it, been winning it. But I blew the bear out, Zan sucked me up behind those horns and I won the rodeo. And yep. again, pride of ownership has taken so many guys out of the championship field because I got yep. a horse, I don't need anything else. Yeah, and speaking yep. of great horses, and we've seen at the finals, pockets of Caleb Schmitz. How good is that horse and how much has that horse helped his success? You know, that's a, the best money he's ever spent. I mean, he gave 60 or 70,000 way back there, you know, but that horse, that horse, he doesn't even have a price on him. He, right. Caleb Smith, when Caleb Smith shows up wanting to rope and he's got pocket sharp, you're not going to get by Caleb Smith. Right. I, I mean, I think he, I think Caleb falls in right there top 10 ropers maybe you know all times out there and especially out there he knows how to use his horse how to win i i saw him um i can't remember who it was but maybe marty or something and rode him at salinas one day and got the jerk down to win the rodeo and the next day at nampa i think smith was six eight on him you know he's that type of horse that just doesn't yeah. come around and and smith knows it and he uses him to his ability and, and doesn't just burn him up anymore. But the good ones like that make the difference. I mean, they just, they do. I mean, look at Primetime. I I, I bought yeah. Primetime. I, I sold Primetime back to JD because I hated him. I just, I hated him when I owned him. He was not the same as when he had five or six guys run, riding him. And when I bought him, it was just me and JD. I didn't want, you know, I said, man, I give a lot of money. I don't want to make him mount horse. But after that, I sold him back with a free seat. And I won eighty thousand on him the next year, flying in and out riding him. You know, and oh, uh, JD would just, he, I, you're not riding today. I'm not. Yeah, I am too. But it, that horse was better when he made five or six runs a day. You know, so yeah. they have their own quirks, but the good ones stand out. You know, I, I tell everybody they always ask me what's your best horse, and I said, well, I have to say it was Pat, my first horse, my, my big dun with long mane and tail, because. I gave ten thousand dollars for him in May of 1985, and he failed two vet checks. You know that was a lot of money back then, especially well, I was for say, yeah. Had, you know, oh, he ain't gonna last six months. You know, and and a dear friend of mine, Calvin Greeley, had trained him, and he said he's got the heart of a lion. You buy him, he'll last. And I rode him the last. I think the last finals I rode him was 91 or two. You know, what I mean, he lasted for a long time, and he was that kind, like pockets, like. 
one year Ricky won uh, Cheyenne on him. You know, and you can't have a harder setup than that. And it was the same year that two, I think, that 4th of July that year at West Jordan, I tied one in 6-7 that was a record for years, you know. The low loping paints that you turned around, he, he could do it all. And, and everybody says, you really think he was your best? And I said, I have to say that because I may not have been who I, I wound up being without, without that great horse right off the bat, you know? Yeah. He gave you confidence everywhere. That's right. That's right. And we know confidence. And, you know, I bought a horse from Vince Walker, Roni. I don't know if you remember that big yeah, Roni horse with yeah. a huge mane. Well, it was 2000 and that was 2004. And uh, no, I'm sorry, 2003. Anyway, I, 2003. I gave a lot of money at the time, 35000 in 2003. Yeah. For him, and he was crippled, just like he said. Yeah. But I'd known that horse. I'd seen him go and, and uh, talk about a heart of a lion, too. You know, people go, well, he ain't going to last you very long. Well, he lasted me long enough where he got good use out of him. He got, you know, he got took care of and I was able to win. I even rode him at the NFR that year uh, for the first four rounds and then jumped off because obviously pride of ownership. But man, I, I took care of that horse and they end up high school rodeo on him, college rodeo on yep. him. You know, th these horses, they, they know how to take care of themselves. And again, that horse gave me confidence. And when you talk about spending money, it you know it's an investment to better yourself and people don't realize that they're like ah, that's a lot of money for a horse well yeah but in the long run in the long run it's gonna it's supposed to pay off for guys like us yeah you have to buy i mean it's the same old deal as like you know taking a taking a toyota to the indy 500 you're not gonna win much you know right it's the same thing you can place you can wind up at the back of the field but that's not where we wanted always to be you know and I think in any any event, the standout winners also have the same the same mentality in, of a horse. You know what I mean? Yeah. You have a horse that want, that, that that craves it, and that they want to win. They love it. They're you know they're tough. They take the runs. They're good. They want to haul. You get somewhere and unload them, and they greet the grass and lay down. They roll in the sand when you give them a chance. They drink. They eat. They they love it. You know they're. I have an old roan horse that John rode the last couple of years. He's, I think he's 19 or 20 this year. And the other day, you know, I, we were loading the trailer to leave and he was nickering over the fence, you know, like, Hey, what about me? You know, but I think it's, I think it's with anything. It's like, it's like watching a football player, you know, that they come in here with a casted hand with their thumb barely sticking out. You know, if they broke their hand or a lineman and they're down there playing and blocking with it. You know, you don't, you don't take the heart of a winner and a world champion for granted, but you also don't take it with a grain of salt. Yeah, for sure. No, and speaking of world champions, your first one at age 20, and I love to hear this story because, well, I believe it was Denver. You had a chance to yep. win the rodeo and, and George Gibbs is flag, and he said you didn't clear the calf and flagged you out. Is that that's right? Yep. Yeah, I won the first round, or either I won the second round, but the other round, he flagged me out to win it. I was going to win both rounds. It'd be high call, you know. Or I tell you what, Denver might have been straight two head back then even. I don't even know if they had a short go back then. Anyway, he told me, he said, man, you didn't get a cast. I said, yeah, he was up. He said, no, he wasn't. He said, you're in the pro rodeo now. You'll learn to do by the rules. I'm like, okay. And I'm thinking to myself the whole time, you don't know me very well because I hate rules anyway. I don't like any kind of rules. In the arena, out of the arena, whatever, you know. So, And then it come down the last one at the finals, and I had a Hereford, and I had to win the round or – you know, win second round, I think, place in the average, and I had a big old Hereford, and I did a terrible job in my slack. You know, I see that run a million times, and I'm thinking, you, you dumbass. All you had to do is turn him to the outside, and, you know, you're, you win the round by a whole second, and I tried to cram it inside, and I caught him coming off my leg, and he died off, and I thought, you know, you die by the blitz, you, you live good by the blitz. You got two choices. You can set him down. Standing back up, you're not going to win the world. You'll win maybe a couple thousand the average. Or you could pull him up your leg, and if he thinks he's up, he's going to give it to me. And if he thinks he's out, he's going to flag me out. And when I threw my hands up, I'll be honest, Luke, either way it would have been fine with me because it was my decision. It was, in, And it's just like I've told people about my life and my decisions and some bad ones I made. I never ran from them because they were my decisions. I'm, I, I, Good or bad, I made them. And, and I had a real good friend of mine taught me when I was young, you make your decisions, you you deal with the consequences. And you deal with them yourself, don't run and hide behind people. So when I threw my hands up walking back, I thought, I'm either world champ or I'm flagged out. You know, that's how it's gonna be. Right. And when I got on and he's right. 
looking at his watch, I'm like, I got it. I got him. I got him this time. He got me last time. My man got him this time. <laughs> uh, well, we talk about luck and, and how much the flaggers play a role in, in everything. And uh, yeah, again, we've we've all we've had calls like that, or I've had calls like that. We're like, eh, I don't know if that one's up or not. And sure enough, drops a flag. And then you thought, and I just threw the ever living shit out of this steer. And, and it you flagged get up, you out. And he's still holding the flag. You're like, did I miss well, something here? It cost you a gold buckle, you know. It cost you one at the finals. I mean, 50-50 goes either way. You give the tie to the runner, you take the tie away. Sometimes we, we I had that one gave to me. I had one taken away. And you've had some give to you. But, man, on that biggest stage when they take one away, it's like me. If he'd have flagged me out, that would have been, you know, that would have hurt because I took the chance. But your deal was when you threw him, you thought it was a done deal. Yeah. And they get that taken away. So what people, what I always got kind of aggravated me with people, they're like, you're all your luck. You get all the break stuff. Hey, go back and look at my stuff. I also had some breaks that cost me a lot. And what yeah. people don't realize, Luke, it's not just um, it's not just that notch on your belt that you could add another gold buckle to. It's the bonus money and the extras yes. that it cost a guy. You know, man, that's when, like, the one year I'd come in behind and, caught i think it was it was, Her, it was herbert and i'd caught him by the 10th round you know ninth round i mean ninth round i'm in the lead or i'm right there with him when i'm winning second average all i gotta do is tie two down second average is more back then than two rounds and if he doesn't win both rounds you know and i run through the barrier so i cost myself a gold buckle 13 dollars and 10 cents and everybody's like oh man and then what they didn't realize i was mad that but that 13 dollars cost me seventy five thousand in yeah. bonuses back then and that was i don't know when that was that was a long time ago you know 90 well, you're, something yeah you're right because i was with us smokeless i believe when that happened to me and my bonuses with them and all my other sponsors it was well over 100 grand uh not sure. to count what you were going to win in the average and and you know it was i bet it was damn near one hundred twenty-five thousand dollar hickey uh you know and the gold buckles nice and love but if i'd had that 125k i would have invested it and i'd be a billionaire by now yeah. Oh, yeah. He's been smart. <laughs> we want to think that anyway. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right. Exactly. And I mean, going into that, like what you have won, and I wish I, at a younger age, I would have been better and told more how to take care of myself after rodeo. But I know you got rental properties. You got, you did a good job investing for the future after rodeo. You know, I had the best advice ever from Denny Flynn. And he, he's a really good friend of mine. And his wife and Jenna are like, sisters growed up together and stuff so back and i don't know when this was but i'm gonna say early 90s or middle 90s or something we were had i think we we're having dinner at the finals or something they they come out and visit you know denny won denny was runner up in the world championship i don't know how many times won the average of bull riding i mean he was he told me he said hey he said i'm gonna tell you something i said what's that he said while money is easy pay for things and i'm like money's not easy he said yeah it is you enter on monday you go compete all week and next monday they pay you and you're winning you're winning a lot. So, and, and, and I was like, man, so it just kind of set a deal in me where if I like when I won Calgary, you know, or if I had a good final stuff, we'd come home, you know, I'd buy something. I'd buy a one rental house. I'd buy, I bought a fourplex one time. I bought five acres here. You know, uh, I have a dear friend of mine. It's a real estate guy and Huntsville Jeff Markham. And he's, and he's always told me, you know, Hey, if you can buy five acres, 10 acres, 20 acres, 50, whatever, just buy something if you can and sit on it, it'll always go up it's never going down right and and i bought you know five acres here and i bought 30 here and i bought eight over here and i bought 10 here and little stuff like that that you don't think much of you know now it, I, one of the places i bought i don't know Luke, it had to be 25 years ago and i just don't do much with it i mean i turn old old calves out on it you know to graze it and just keep i just kind of forget about it till time to go get them and take them a sale and take another load and the other day you know people call about wanting to buy it and it's worth like six times what i gave for it you know it's it's crazy how you know and i i try to tell the guys nowadays i said man listen best advice i ever got was pay for stuff you know i mean i had an agent and he's 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 since pa he's passed away now but sam applebaum and he was we sat down one day at my my big table on my and and had lunch and and signed a contract for video games and stuff and when he left i walked Jenna went to the bank Monday and paid our place off. You know, I mean, I didn't have it because it was gone, but I had stuff paid for all my life. So it right. it was, yeah, that, that Denny Flynn and Jeff Markham, 
uh, were probably the two most influential people that it made it to where you know I'm I'm no Rockefeller or nothing like that by no means, but but I, I, we're comfortable and we can do what we want and enjoy life like we want, and it, it's all come from rodeo. Well, and that's again, I try to tell all the kids, uh, the students, make sure you invest, be smart with your money. You know, you, yeah, you know, make sure you have something after rodeo, but you don't know. If it ends tomorrow, you don't know if it ends 20 years from now, but always give yourself something to, to have when you're when you're done. Yeah, and you know what else I tell them all the time? If you get a chance and you get a scholarship to a college and they're paying for an education, don't just piss it off. Go right. learn something. Learn. It, it's free, it's during the day, it's usually hot. If you're in the heat, it's cold if you're in the cold. Go, go, go sit a class and learn something. Learn how to do something for free because you'll never know in life when you might need it. You know, I can remember my grandmother. She was a ladies lady. You know, she lived in Houston and she was a ladies lady. I can remember her. I mean, I was young, man, sitting down with us for dinner one night. She was having a dinner party and teaching me what fork was a salad fork and what was the dessert spoon and the size. And you know what I mean? All that. And I'm like, what? And she said, you never know. One day you might be at a dinner that's very important and you don't want to look stupid using right. the wrong stuff. What a finger bowl was and shit like that. You know what I mean? Well, go 30, 20 years. I don't know. What in 20 years? Go 16, 18 years down the road. And I'm having a dinner in Vegas one night, you know, for a contract that's going to change a lot of the way we live. I mean, it was a five year. And this was in 90. I want to say 96 or seven, and it was 25,000 a year for five years. That was a lot back then. Yeah. And, and sure as shit, we sit down and I mean, it's a four course meal and it starts napkins and you folded the way that you unfold them back over themselves, you know, and the, all the stuff. And, you know, Jen and I sat down there, she already knew I stuff. I didn't know it, you know, till my grandmother taught me, we sat down there and had dinner visiting these people. And the, and the, the, the one thing I remember leaving there is when I got a phone call the, a few days later and said, hey, we're going to send you a contract, blah, blah, you know. And she said, the one, the, I will tell you one thing. I was very impressed in the way you conducted yourself outside of the rodeo world. That meant something, yeah. you know. And, and without my grandmother teaching me and with the days, the way people live today and, and, you know, it's fast food and it's internet and it's no family togetherness and it's no, you know, they're going to have a hard time learning all that. No, 100% right. Yeah, and and the, those are things in their lives that could change like it did, you know, possibly helped you. These people are like, okay, we know sure. this guy's successful in the arena, but he also knows how to conduct himself outside. And, and that's going to bring me to this next point. You're, one of your teachers at your school, sister, and I can't remember her name, but you tell the story at the Resist All Rookie Luncheon, how she helped push you to be as good of a public speaker as you are. Yeah, she, she's the one that told me, <clears throat> you know, I, we got stuck in this class because me and my buddy, we we must have changed some grades or I don't know what happened, but we got stuck in this class. We had no business in. And it was my senior year. And I'm telling you, there was three girls and he and I in it. And they were the, the brains of the school, you know. And, and I went to her and I said, oh, there's been a mistake. We don't belong in here, you know. We need out of here. And she's like, yeah, y'all do. But now you're in here. You're going to learn. And and it was a, it was a – literature speech class kind of combined deal and you know she would give us something to report on and she'd tell me beaver don't don't take time trying to write all this up you're not gonna you're not gonna follow you just when you get in here tomorrow i want to hear it and i'll be like i don't even know what i'm gonna do yet you know it's due wednesday and it's monday and I, she said no i gave it to you last wednesday and yes <laughs> it's due wednesday you're gonna have it ready and it's wednesday morning she'd say okay get up here and tell us about so I'd get up there and man, I'd here I'd go with my, you know, spill. I would I would try to go through everything I thought what the points, you know, and the footnotes and the, you know, the main topic and the meat of the story. And I'd get done. And every time I did it, she would tell me, "You're getting better. You're getting where you can talk. You're getting well." well she put me on the spot. You know what I mean? Right. She would just call me out, put me on the spot. They would get up with 14 pages of you know and read it, and it'd be it took a whole class. I get up there in about 15 minutes, I was done. And she said, you're going to have to learn to do it that way because you're better with your brain and your mouth than you'll ever be with your time and your pen. And so she did. And, and it's carried over. Man, Luke, it's carried over, you know, for I've been out of the game a long time now. You know, I've been out of the game since 06. 
and and it's carried me right on through through tv through public speaking through talks i mean it's it's been there for me well and just for me at a young age getting to hear you speak and now getting to work with you and how you you know speak and compose yourself and put your sentences together you put your words together i've learned a ton just listening to you talk and how you you know present yourself in in the situations you're in and i think it's so dang impressive and you know for me just kind of being a bullshitter and trying to piece stuff together i've learned a lot from listening to you so again uh, talking about how we've you've come up or i've come up with you and uh just learning from you i appreciate that because i'd be over here stuttering and spitting and probably not know how to do it but what i will say is i wish every rodeo athlete would listen and pay attention to how you speak and how you talk to the cameras, to kids, to a, a sponsor. Because man, it's it's painful listening to some of these contestants speak. It really it, it is, and you know, and I appreciate that because, you know, I am an old guy in, in a business still, you know. But I, I wanted to try. I, I want to think that I left some in there and I helped some guys get through different ways. You know what I mean? The, the fun thing for me, when I look at a guy like you coming in young, okay, I see the, the eye of the tiger. You got a little different look. A little bramer head up looking over the fence, you know, trying to find somewhere else to go. Want to be better. But when you can take advantage of a guy like me that's going to, you know, ahead of you and and has already been there, but and you can really pull something good out of that, it, look what it's done. I mean, not, not that I've done it, don't get me wrong, but look what a little bit of you paying attention and reaching out is done. You've been able to carry it on, and now you're going the same route I went. Man, Joe, I appreciate you coming on the show. And, and again, thank you for what you've done for the sport uh, and mainly what you've done for me in my career from getting to rodeo with you, getting to travel with you, getting to learn from you on how to speak, how to talk, how to you know compose myself to sponsors, to TV and, and, and everything, man. It, this, is, uh, this has been fun. I, I know the fans are going to love it. And... Um, and we'll have to do it again. We will do it again, and I appreciate all that. It means a lot to me, and I enjoyed it. But i tell you what I really enjoyed the other day. I enjoyed you down in the arena watching your boy, you know, you and Br Bray Arms down there, just just like y'all are about to run one at the finals. That's what's the fun part for me. I've always said, you know, all of y'all, and I call all y'all boys, y'all are all young, young to me, you know, and I got to watch y'all come along, and, and it was fun being part of that, and now it's fun seeing you on the other side of the nickel. So, Greatly enjoyed, greatly, greatly, uh, forever be glad of our friendship and getting to go with you. I was at the end, but you were at the front. At the front, it was fun, and uh, best to you. And I'll see you when I see you, buddy. Yes, sir. Thanks, Joe. I'm hot. It's 400 degrees in Huntsville. <laughs> <laughs> I'm here at the 2023 Hall of Fame induction ceremony. I'm proud to have Husky Trailers and Parts Company as a sponsor of this episode. 